Thank you, Pastor Tim. In the name of the one who was, and the one who is, and the one who, and the one who is to come. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, one little pastor trick that we learned along the way is, is that if it's not loud enough, we usually have to say it. You know, we can get them to say it again. But I can actually hear that this morning. So, amen. I will make you do it again. No light here. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> do you know what the most powerful sense of the five senses that we have is, and the one that is most connected to memory? Take a guess. It's smell. You know what I smelled the first thing I walked in the door this morning? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, not going there, I promise. Coffee. Amen. Yes. There's something like when you ever you have that, that sense of ah, everything is going to be all right. Because let's be honest, anytime as a pastor or as a layperson I walk into a new setting, there's always the nerves. There's always the, oh, are they going to like me? Or, oh, or oh, am I going to praise God in a way that, that Jesus will be, will be proud? Or is, but then you smell the coffee, and then you know everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Amen? All right. Amen. You get that same feeling sometimes whenever you walk into somebody's house for the first time. You get that sense of, ah. Oh, this is a place where God is. This is a place where Jesus is worshipped. This is a place where the Holy Spirit has took up residence here. My name is Ross Mowry. I am a candidate for the Christ Play Minister Program. I come to ministry in terms of this old phrase, the once and future king. Well, I was a once and future pastor. I served in the United Methodist Church for over 10 years, and then I burnt out, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a demanding job, as Pastor Tim can attest, and all other of you that know pastors that um, have experienced those moments of just extreme burden. But the Lord kept bringing me back to ministry to serve for him. And now I'm serving in a pastoral role, but as a lay person. So I kind of have my feet in two different worlds. I am the visitation pastor at Evangelical United Methodist Church in New Holland, Pennsylvania. I live in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. And I have the chance to use old experiences, but with a fresh perspective. And Jesus offers so many opportunities to be able to serve him. And this is such a unique way for me to be able to do that. So let's get into the word, enough about me, let's get into the word. And I wanna set the scene for you for the scripture this morning. How many of you have ever worked or volunteered as a teacher? How many of you, for those of you who have ever taught someone how to do something, have ever had to teach someone how to do something where the other person has no idea what you're talking about? <laughs> There lots of hands gets raised on that one. Welcome to the world of the Apostle Paul. We're talking 53 to 54 AD. This is where Paul is literally working with the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church has had its squabbles about how to start and how to do ministry. But what we discover as we look at this entire book is that the Corinthian church really doesn't have much 
knowledge at all about even the most fundamental, the most basic things. In 1 Corinthians 12, there were arguments about who has the greatest place in the church. And we get this, we get this classic, classic description of the body of Christ and who and what it all means to be a part of it. But that's what sets up 1 Corinthians 13 about what the most important aspects of the church really are. And so if you'll follow along with me, the scripture passage for this morning is 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 4. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may your words be my words. May your message be my message for your people today. Amen. The Corinthian church really didn't know how to love because the Corinthian church was part of a broader culture that didn't know how to love. And so talking about God's unconditional love as something that should be paramount in the life of any believer was something that was completely foreign to them. It was something that may not have existed at all in a place that called itself a church. And so we see Paul beginning to lay the foundations of a absolutely critical base of knowledge for this church to be able to serve the community around them. It's also important to hear other voices about what the society was like before Christ had become part of that society, but also what it became after Christ became followed by more people. Hear these words from Justin Martyr. We who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else, now that being now we bring what we have into a common fund and we share with everyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and, and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. And now because of Christ, we live together just at, with the rich and we pray for our enemies. Isn't that an interesting take on how Christ has changed that community at that time? Amen? Amen. The sermon title today is Be Kind. And kindness or even, the, or even the short form of the word kind is something that is, you can find it on a teacher's door, you can find it on a candy bar wrapper, a protein bar called kind. I don't even know what's in that, but okay, okay, call it kind. You can find, you can find the word pretty much every, 
everywhere in our world today, but it's one of those words that has a very shallow, if not empty, meaning behind it for just to be good. But kindness, as we look at it as Christians, means something much more than that. And there are many um, definitions for what kindness is, but often we, re we remember what kindness isn't. It's much easier to define that way. The person who cut us off on the Route 30 bypass or on I-95. You know, and especially in this part of the world where I live in the northern part of the county where the storms come and there are branches everywhere and there's no <coughs> warning when you turn the corner and there would be a branch that doesn't get moved for days. I'm sure that would never happen here. We can def easily define what kindness isn't. What we should be doing today is defining what it is and where it comes from. And the word kind, or even derivations of that word, it doesn't appear much in Scripture at all. It, in the New Testament itself, it only appears seven times. It's because Kindness is something that is a is an is an effect. Can you e f f e c t? An effect of love. And obviously, as pa as Paul was saying, if you have not love, then you have nothing. But if you do have love, you have this. And this is from Galatians five twenty two, very famous phrase in our scriptural and in our learning life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And like most words that get translated from the original Greek, as you know, love has three different trans three different there's three Greek words for love for the American English word for love. And similarly for kindness, there are three Greek words for that. The meanings, though, don't vary a whole heck of a lot, though. There is the word karestos, which means useful or tender-hearted. The second one is krestos, uh, take away an extra syllable there, which also means useful and being upright. Uprightness, being someone that is trustable. And we see this version of the word in the letter of Paul to Philemon later in the New Testament, where the slave that he wants, that he, that he was trying to protect in some way, the name Onesimus means useful, also in the Greek. But the third one, which is a, another less pronounceable version of this word, in conjunction with the first two definitions, has one word that kept coming up for me that I want to share with you. I've looked in 10, 12 different translations of this word, kind, and this word kept coming up as the most applicable English translation of it. You ready for this one? Benign. Benign. The only times that we use the word benign in our English vernacular is to describe a tumor that is not cancerous. <coughs> but in the Greek form of the word benign, it means something completely different. So much so that the Greek word for benign was translated into something very, very famous. 
which millions of people who do ministry do today. How many of you serve in medicine as a doctor, a nurse, or have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews that serve as nurses or as doctors or in any kind of a medical field? My mother is a retired registered nurse. Served, in OBG, served as an OBGYN nurse in emergency situations all of her life. My uncle was in home health care. I was a hospital chaplain. My godmother was also a nurse and on her tombstone, she wanted, the, she wanted her name, Jackie Buller, RN, because of how important her ministry was in her life. And this word benign, that it was translated into this that, that is said, when you choose to become a doctor or a nurse, the Hippocratic Oath, and in Greek it says, primera non nocere, but it says in English, first do no harm. First do no harm. Benign things, whether they are something as scary as a tumor or anything else in this world, if they are benign, they do no harm. Kindness means that we give everything we have in the name of God and in so helping in that loving kindness manner that we do no harm. Amen? Amen. And we as churches have to be cognizant of this in how we minister to others. Sometimes in the name of God where we do the best that we can, we as a church not this church necessarily, but the Big C Church. We often can run a very, very important risk of doing more harm as opposed to no harm. And there was really no other example of this than the following I'm about to read to you. We're going to go back into the Word again. And that is Luke 10. Luke 10. 30 through 37. You will immediately recognize it. Brothers and sisters, hear the words from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down to the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, the Levite, when he came to this place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where this man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring, and oil, pouring on oil and wine. Then when he put the man on his own donkey, he took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, and one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. The religious professionals passed by on the other side. The one who was the enemy 
provided the most amount of care. He provided the living embodiment of kindness. Why did the first two people pass by him? Was it because the beaten and bloody man was ritually unclean? Possibly. If he was dirty, if he was bloodied, and if he was not seen as somebody that they could be with without being, un being made unclean themselves, then they passed by on the other side. Saying a prayer over them from a distance would certainly not suffice as well as what this Samaritan man did. Amen? And in these parables that Jesus gave, these parables were, were based not loosely out of a story, but certainly based in reality, where this would have been something that would have certainly been a part of the experience of the people that he was speaking to. Where there were needs of people who were not in good shape, but needed the, needed the touch of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus gave an example of how to do it. If you're going to be kind, go all out. Be kind comprehensively. The comprehensively meant that this man gave at least two days' wages, two denarii, two silver coins, to make sure that this man had a place to recover. He gave up his perception, or not caring so much about what others may have thought, by meeting this man in the dirtiest place with the dirtiest stuff around him and bandaging his wounds. Touching another person's blood would have made you unclean. By bandaging his wounds, by putting him on his own donkey, and sacrificing something that we as American Christians hold in the most highest of regard, and that is time. He gave up his time. So in every conceivable way, the Samaritan man gave kindness, was kind to this individual. And it must be said, that being kind, the word kind, is what part of speech? It's a verb. It's active. It's ongoing. It's moving. Love, even in the agape form of, of the Greek, is not a noun. It's not a person or a place or a thing. A agape means it's a verb, unconditional love. Something that must be ongoing, must be doing, it must be being, it must keep going. Does that make sense? Love, and by proxy, kindness, is never, ever static. This world today, and I, we spoke about this as we were having coffee this morning, is really confused about what love is, and therefore what kindness is. A kindness is not a retweet over something relatively funny in Twitter. A kindness is not getting an extra cheeseburger in a bag at McDonald's when the person put, put it there by accident. It's not, it, 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 it's not something superficial, and it never has been. 
I'm at that age where I have kids who are teenagers, but I also, my ministry is with older adults at, my, at the church of where I work. So I see where kindness can be applied in a way that makes the most amount of difference, like smell, and kindness can, is not easily forgotten. My daughter, my oldest daughter, graduated from high school over the, in the summertime. And for those of you who have been to graduations, whether in high school or college or preschool or whatever, the, the, the speakers usually say the same thing. There's, there is a, you've done good. We love you because you've done good. Other people have done good, so you do better. The end, right? The assistant superintendent of Baltimore City Schools said something that completely deviated from that pattern, and it blew me away. So much so that I borrowed a pen from the person sitting next to me and I wrote it down. I want to share it with you now. She followed that same pattern of, you're good, thanks for being good, well done. And then in the advice part of that same speech, she said, and I quote, be kind to yourselves. There was no more chatter at Towson University's very large auditorium. Be kind to yourself. We do not live in a world that natively knows how to be kind to one another. And thus, we, it is no secret that the generations that are around us do not know how to be kind to, to ourselves. Why? Because if kindness is an effect of love, It's because so many people in our world do not know what the love of Jesus Christ is. And because of that, if Jesus is, loves us to the point where we know that even because of our imperfections or our failings, that Jesus, through his grace, loves us anyway, delights in us anyway, Kindness to ourselves and others becomes that much easier. We as Christians have to be examples of that. Examples of kindness that goes far beyond superficial things, but kindness like smelling a great cup of coffee when you walk in the door or something that touches you to the deepest part of your heart, that the love and the kindness that we bring will change a heart forever, a heart that can turn to Jesus Christ. It touched a man in the first century, Corinth, who said, we, we who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else, 
Now, now bring what we have into a common fund and there with anyone who needs it and share with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and we refused to associate with people or of another race or country. And now because of Christ, we live together as the rich people and pray for our enemies. Imagine what we can do as a little C church, a big C church, a world that brings Jesus Christ and makes him known and does great works through his love and shows truly how to be kind in a world that certainly needs a 